So now we light our chalice, joining with other Unitarian Universalists around the world. The light of the chalice represents so many things to this congregation. The light of shared community, the light of knowledge and inquiry, and the light within each of us that lead us on our spiritual paths. Today's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. What can a father be? When can you be a father? Tradition says it happens in one way, but I, I've never really been so sure. Whether by choice or by chance, the role of a father has changed to fit the needs over the generations. Has it really changed that much, or are we just hearing about it more often? Uh, I tend to think those complaints are just recycled hot air. There have been odd fathers out there the whole time. We're just now starting to communicate enough to actually see them. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free, welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization. These organizations share our values and addresses the need in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civil engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month, except in the summer. Stretch it out a little bit longer. From now through July 9, our plate collection recipient is Freedom House Detroit. Freedom House serves individuals and families who have, filed, who have fled from persecution in their native country and are seeking humanitarian protection. 70% of its clients are victims of torture. Freedom House provides stable housing, legal aid, mental and medical health care access, employment training, all while people await approval of their asylum application. Because of its comprehensive and integrated care model, 85% of its clients exit with jobs and more move into independent housing. BU supported, BUC has supported previous Freedom House projects. Our plate donations at this time will help fund a new kitchen in their facility which serves about 50 people daily.
let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation. You're new today. <laughs> good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We come to the time in our service set aside for centering and spiritual practice. We start with a sharing of joys and sorrows as we do each Sunday. First, a congregate shared this joy, Happy Father's Day and Happy Juneteenth too. Another congregant said, not only should we wish happy birthday to the fathers, but to the grandfathers and to the great-grandfathers who've all shaped us. Among life's joys, we also share in each other's sorrows. A concern from Christine, I received some concerning health issues. I pray I get through this and ultimately become healthier with more energy and attention to my health, healing, and well-being. Let us take a moment to close our eyes. We know that joys and sorrows, as Reverend Mandy has said, are like the rose, both the beauty and the thorns, the dual nature of being human. May we as a community pause to hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows, both spoken and unspoken. Our reading today are words that I like to share from Wendell Berry. At my age, my father held me in his arm like a hooded bird, and his father held him so. Now I grow into brotherhood with my father as he with his has grown. Now he speaks in me as when I knew him first, as his father in him, as his father spoke in him when he had come to thirst for the life of a young son. My son will know me in himself when his son sits hooded on his arm, and I have grown to be brother to all my father's memory speaking to knowledge finally in my bones. So, little addition to the order of service, since we have the time, we're doing three reflections today. 
So with my father, so I'm sorry, so after the with my father. Um, I think fathers have always been nurturers, but that often has been hidden behind the demands to conform to a specific set of rules of masculinity and gender roles. Now my father was a nurturer, one of those under the radar, non-traditional fathers. Arthur Honnold grew up on a farm in Iowa, went to college, which was interrupted by World War II, married a young nurse, had three children, all girls, worked for a small tractor implement firm that was bought by Ford Motor Company, which led to our move to Michigan. So in talking to my um, older sister recently, we talked a lot about what kind of dad he had been. Well, first of all, he was the dad that didn't back away from anything, whether it was washing one kid's hair, whether it was putting a Band-Aid on, whether it was helping with a science diorama, he was there. And in reality, one of the reasons we went to him when we were hurt was because our mother was a nurse and she would get clinical. <laughs> there was not a whole lot of comfort in it, but you know, it was taken care of properly, but it was much more fun to go to dad and get a hug and a cuddle and that's okay. In talking with my oldest sister recently, she pointed out that he also taught us how to troubleshoot. He said, check the obvious first, then change one thing at a time and see what happens. This hierarchical approach, as my sister described it, has been a great help in navigating life, whether it was trying to see why the lawnmower wasn't working or figuring out what approach worked in a job. Dad could see readiness in us for the next step, even though we didn't often think we were, in a very intuitive way, guiding us to learn to ride a bike, telling my sister it was time to drive a car or take a more advanced class. He was open to seeing the special in each of us. He also said he was always happy to have daughters. We never felt he was disappointed at not having a son. We grew up feeling that we had no limitations with him. He was also not a man's man. At most, he would listen to a baseball game on the weekend, but he did like to fish, and he included each of us in this. We each had a special outing one-on-one -on -one, over time in the summers to a favorite fishing spot. He got us small fishing poles real fishing poles, rods and reels, not those toy things you get at Target. He taught us how to cast, how to be patient, the hardest lesson to learn, how to sense a strike on the line, and how to prepare your catch, meaning how to gut a fish. And most important of all, you had to bait your own hook. He was a born tinkerer. You have to be when you grow up on a farm. I loved hanging around him when he was working on something. It could be a misbehaving radio or building something for the house. He never told me or my sisters to go away. My sister remembers our mother sending us down to his workshop in the basement, telling him to get us out of his hair. He let us play with a bin of nuts and bolts to see how they went together. I would pester him with questions about why he was doing what he was doing, and he would patiently explain. He died when I was 16, and the workshop became my refuge, a place where I could hold him close. But I knew he had given me the skills I needed to keep things going. I became the tinkerer, painting rooms, fixing toilets, doing just about anything to help keep the house going. To this day, I still love the smell of wood and sawdust. I met my husband at the University of Michigan Sailing Club when the boathouse needed shingling, and we were up on the roof when he introduced himself. He shops for my Christmas presents at Home Depot, 
And when our kids were little, I built them a playhouse, not a kit, from scratch. Okay. And I shingled it, because I got the skills back with the boathouse. There is one event that helped me see who my father truly was, the baby whisperer. The young couple had a newborn that, like most newborns, would cry a lot. Looking for answers, they came over one night thinking that my mother, the nurse, might have the answer. Was it colic? Was it just general upset tummies? Anything. And, but my dad was the one who took the baby in his arm and cupped the head in his hand. And his hand was big, and her body pretty much just filled to his elbow. And he just rocked her back and forth, crooning and talking to her like she was the center of the world. She soon quieted down and lay in his arms, staring at his face. Each generation of fathers since him have been able to redefine what being a father, what parenting is all about. The idea that there is one way to be a father is not viable. Non-traditional is not a negative. It simply is saying there is no need to try and fit all in a prescribed box. Let us celebrate all the ways we can be nurturing fathers and parents that allow children to thrive.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Rooney. I've been a member at BUC for over 15 years, and I have been an unacquainted Unitarian Universalist all my life. I grew up in the 60s in California with Lutheran influences from my grandma and atheist and communist influences from my grandpa. We moved to Michigan in the 70s to be close to my mother's traditional agrarian family and their antebellum roots. I didn't fit in this quaint community with my long blonde hair, my questions about God and religion, and most of all, my beliefs that women should have equal rights, equal status, and the appropriate honorific of Ms. After high school graduation, I found myself in the U.S. Navy serving on board a submarine fleet in the Pacific. That didn't go any better. After the Navy, I went to Michigan State University to get my baccalaureate degree in biology. I met my wife, Claudia Coker, and we fell in love. She was finishing up her PhD in finance. We got married. We graduated and we began our careers while starting a family. We decided, decided to adopt our children from South Korea. May was our first baby and she was the joy of our life. We were very busy working and taking care of May and then the big question arose. How do we have a second baby while both of us work full time and how do we ensure that all of our needs are taken care of? The answer was obvious, yet very difficult. Claudia was pursuing tenure, uh, tenure position at the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Business and could make a lot more money and secure much better benefits than I could at my job. The decision was practically made for us. I would become the stay-at-home dad. Soon, our second little bundle of joy, Min, arrived from South Korea. My transition began. It wasn't easy. I frequently had nightmares that first year, and I can still recall how traumatizing those dreams were. When we told new friends and neighbors what I did for a living, they would respond with a quick smile and a statement, no, <laughs> what do you really do? <laughs> I had to appease their curiosity with a list of my manly accomplishments, including my home repairs and construction projects that I had taken up in my free time. One of my, neighbor, um, my, one of my new neighborhood friends would come over to my house jeeringly calling from the sidewalk up to the driveway. Hey, Cinderfella, Cinderfella, where are you? Very few mothers would agree to have play dates with our children because their husbands were uncomfortable with a stay-at-home dad. One of the play date mothers entered our house and performed a physical walkthrough and mental inspection of our kitchen, our living room, and our bathroom. I had just finished cleaning, so I think I passed. In bigger play date groups, I would be privy to stories of harrowing accounts of pregnancies and difficult births. Over the years, I noticed that most fathers parent oftentimes a little different than mothers. My daughter flattened two bike tires before she was six years old. May would ride her pedal bike. Sorry. May would ride her pedal bike as fast as she could and then stand up on the pedals and leave a black skid mark 12 feet long. She was a thing of beauty. She was marvelous. She would stand up on those brake pedals and ride that bike. It would sway to and fro and she'd leave a trail of rubber, rubber and she would smile from ear to ear. It was magnificent. 
While at the city pool one day, May and her friend wanted to jump off the high dive. I didn't know about that, so I said, we need to set a prerequisite swimming test. And I said that you need to swim across the adjoining Olympic-sized pool across not the length of it, but the width of it. They finished easily, and I had been following them to ensure their safety. As they touched the side of the pool, I looked back. Min had jumped in and was following us in tow and finished the swim pridefully. His head popped out of the water and he said, I want to jump off the high dive too. And at this point, he had finished the prerequisite swim, so I didn't have a choice. He had to go off the high dive. And I want to tell you a little bit about Min. At the time, he was five or six years old and he was short for his age. So, when he stood, when he stood at the high dive ladder, the first rung hitting mid thigh. So, as he stood at the high dive ladder, the steps were, were thigh high, the lifeguard looked at me as, and asked, is this a good idea? <laughs> Min began the ascent up the ladder. He got to the platform and walked out to the end of the board, holding on to the railings that were above his head. He took a big breath and jumped into the water. He came to the surface and swam to the pool edge like a pro. Later that night, when he told his mother about his high dive experience, I got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> As teenagers, May's girlfriends found a it a bit uncomfortable that her dad was always home doing housework and cooking. Min just wanted our family to be normal. Why can't we just have one normal thing, he would say. We were an interracial family. My wife Claudia worked full time. I stayed at home as a homemaker. And maybe, most importantly, most significantly, most oddly, we were Unitarian Universalists. We were not Christians. We were not Muslims. We were not Jewish. Over the years, I found the stereotypical observations of, making, of homemaking are not gender specific, but rather workplace specific. I found you can be a traditionalist and a liberal when it comes to family and careers. And I have most recently found that sometimes the rewards of parenting are not fully realized until your children move out, start careers, have loving relationships, and create their own families. Hi, I'm Derek. <clears throat> Been coming here for about 20 years now. Some of you uh, may remember my, uh, my son going through bridging last year and mentioning he studied Satanism and decided it wasn't for him. You know what? Knowledge is power. I'm all right with that. Yeah. Suffice to say, standing in front of you, not exactly a traditional dad from the get-go. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you don't mind, I got to get the dad joke out here. Uh, while I'm doing this, has anyone else here had a father that encouraged them to, uh, to play with fire? To find out about it? Yeah? That feels much better. <clears throat> right? I figured it was better to find an understanding than to find out accidentally the power, right? Go, play with it, understand it. Gain some confidence, right? Do it in a controlled setting, and then take it big, right? With an attitude like that, and the third generation being raised like that, I am a little worried for the world that we are uh, unleashing our children upon. 
Uh, you know, I wanted to spend my time talking about gender roles, but that's, that's already been mentioned. I mean, fatherhood, is it any different from responsible parenthood? Remove the gendered labels. Yeah, we've been on that train for a while. Uh, you know, I'd be taking, uh, you know, last week's New York media, uh, NYC's on the media, did a fantastic job of doing all the research that I could have done in the last 120 years of newspaper headlines, giving examples from each decade about men becoming less masculine, women becoming more, fem uh, less feminine. Um, best one was uh, from the Associated Press in 1925, quoting that, men becoming effeminate, New York physician says, and cites lilac pajamas and embroidered bathrobes as reasons. Uh, I thought they could have gone back even a little bit further than that. I was thinking about a uh, popular little ditty from the 1780s, Yankee Doodle Dandy. If you think about that, Yankee, uh, that was a Dutch insult. John Cheese, Yankee, right? And it kind of took that and owned it. A doodle. Eh, a doodle's nothing much. They're doing, they're just off fancy in their own thing, whatever. And a dandy. <gasps> that was the scurrilous word of its day. And yet here we are, generations later, proud of each one of those things. That was once an insult. I reflected on my journey through fatherhood and realized uh, my kids are too young. I, I don't have a fatherhood journey to reflect on. I don't even know if I'm going to be any good at it yet. I still got time. I'm getting a thumbs up from them, so, so far at least. I started thinking about my father. Served in the Marine, uh, United States Marine Corps. Best summed, taciturn, stoic. Through that, he taught me to show care through action. Don't talk about it, just do it. Adapt and overcome. There were not many other father figures in my life, but he had given me some uh, fairly complexly simple rules to follow as he brought us up. You might not like what someone else is saying, but you should fight for their right to say it. Your right to be angry ends at the tip of someone's nose. Everyone has something you can learn from them. Show them respect. Don't start what you can't finish, but don't be afraid to call in friends if you can't find yourself in trouble. Sleep with dogs, you wake up with fleas. He also taught the magic of bringing an extra sandwich when you're going shopping. You never know what's going to happen. Someone may need it. You know, funny story at the right time can get you that 10, 20% discount. Just thanks a lot. That, that, that wink, we all know it. But one of the most important things he ever really told me, I remember it was uh, one teary night in the bathroom after a really horrible bout of homework that I was still struggling through. He came in and he gave me these words of encouragement and wisdom and said, uh, remember, out of all those sperm and that one egg, it was you. You're worth it. Keep trying. So from there, in the late early, uh, late 80s, early 90s, as I was becoming a teenager, I got introduced to this brand new communication device, a modem, right? Nobody even really thinks about those anymore because it's all just automatically connected everywhere we are. The internet, talking to people, understanding what else is going on in that world. Uh, one of the first lessons I learned was when the FBI takes down a, a bulletin board that you've been calling, you be honest about it right away because your phone line's probably tapped. And, you know, he accepted it. 
He said, well, at least you told me. Now I won't talk about that. Funny guy. Um, but through those message boards, large swaths of humanity, both sides, the best, clearly the worst. I met a person, we became very good friends. Uh, you know, then I also met some people that were exactly like he warned me. Those dogs that if I slept with would have fleas. People trying to entice me to hate as opposed to try to help. During that time, I met a woman. Uh, she was a single mother, never really dated. Uh, she always kept her kids away from the people she dated. I had just graduated high school and she was looking to, at 23, finally get her GED. So I said, oh, I'll help tutor you. I'll help you through the math. And because of that, I, I became a little bit of a fixture in her life. Uh, her young kids, uh, three children, all by different fathers, all in varying degrees of jail or absent. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but I, find my, I found myself falling into an accidental father role. Growing up with those kids, it really got me hooked. You know, uh, it taught me, they taught me the importance of growing a caring community around you when you have struggle, to reach out, right? Don't be afraid to call for friends when you have them and when you need them. Unfortunately, a friend friend passed away but she really taught me that genetics doesn't matter for fatherhood. Uh, her children are all still in my life years after her death. One is uh, insane, uh, not insane, I'm sorry, wrong word. Uh, very deep on the autism spectrum, uh, really wrong word there. But uh, her other two kids, successful, all on the spectrum, and they really taught me, even before I considered having children, what it was like to be a father. My life was the better for them, was the better for them, and definitely opened up. So, opening yourself to caring people, remaining open when things are difficult, and just build that love, grow that boundary, beyond just your genetic family. Build the community you'd love to be in. Reminds me of something I once heard about a village. I forgot to bolt this part. And now on to hymn number 1007. In the teal hymnal, there's a river running through my soul.
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. <laughs>